Hi. Uh, so just a little bit of a motivation and general um, story behind this project. This is part of a larger project uh, at the Max Planck Institute for History of Science, where we're trying to build uh, computational methods to study uh, social epistemic networks, uh, historical knowledge transmission. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? OK, sorry about that. Uh, so as one of, one of our works is to do with uh, community building and external outreach, uh, and a lot of our partners are dealing with correspondence networks, so we, that's where we sort of get interest in it. And uh, I think uh, one of those is uh, from the Republic of Latvia in the Netherlands, and what is interesting about this correspondence uh, data is that you have so many information about it, about the descendants, receivers, locations, and so much more, and you can go on and do you know, this like, interesting sort of network analysis and get all kinds of statistics about it. But you also have to be a little bit critical about the data sources. So one of the things we started looking at, it, this is uh, from the same sample. And when you look at it, at the, first of all, like the degree distribution seems to be very skewed, so very long tails. So it's uh, extremely centered in just a few uh, figures. And the thing we see in terms of geography, so there's a red dot there is the Hague. Uh, so most of the data is just uh, concentrated around one city in the Netherlands with uh, uh, not as much uh, spread around. So uh, this was the sort of motivation that started with the ABM, was trying to understand how is this data generated. Uh, and once we have sort of a knowledge of this, trying to understand uh, a how, so, uh, so we can have a better sense of how knowledge spreads and how this data is created, but also have a better sense of what is the statistics behind uh, those letters. So we can have sort of a benchmark for uh, the networks that we are plotting with the data existent. Uh, so this is a little bit of our motivation, and we started off the, then using an agent-based model in order to achieve just that. Uh, so just a little overview of the general idea of it is an accumulative model where each step we're people writing letters to one another, and then we use that in order to project uh, social epistemic networks, uh, plotting relationship between people and uh, topics. But this is also a self-reinforcing uh, ego random walk where uh, the networks affect the likelihood of whom I'm connecting to, but each letter then reinforces the network. So I'm more likely to write again to the same people uh, about the same topics. Uh, and then we start agent based with this idea. Uh, so we create the agents, we give them topics, we give them a position in space, uh, and we uh, keep a record of every letter they send and every letter they receive and who's from. Uh, and we also have this low, uh, global environment where it is the global map, uh, so, uh, social network, and but the main thing is this lattice where we have the information on who's the sender, the receiver, uh, date, uh, and so much more. Uh, so we create these agents, we place them in space, we use uh, census data of uh, around the same time in order to position them ac across uh, different uh, nuts too in Europe. Uh, and then each round, we activate the agents based on a probability distribution. And when active, they then try to find uh, the closest neighbors, and they will write to them if they have something in common to write about. Um, so the best way to sort of understand this it would be, uh, again, with the ego reinforcement, would be sort of, of a multi-earn model, where you first pick up the, uh, the sender, and the sender, the more letters they send, the more likely they will write it again. Then, then we pick up who they're going to write to. Again, reinforcement, the more they write to someone, the more they will like to uh, write again. And after we run this model, we start with a, so just a brief introduction, we start with 100 agents. We run that for 100 time steps. And in the end, we get a uh, just double ledger uh, time stamp. So this is a little bit of, uh, so I guess not very good to see that. But we have, again, like the information is the sender, the recipient, the location, uh, the topic. And then this is where the pruning come along, is because we can use this information in order to sort of edit which letters uh, we save and preserve in time. So we can delete all the letters from certain, or preserve only the letters from certain uh, receivers. We can do that based on topic. We can do that based on time. Uh, OK, so just one simulation of the model. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is the and social network that we get after hundreds uh, runs of 100 agents. And the degree distribution, which is, uh, is not very skewed as it was in the uh, one we observed with the real data. But then we engage with the pruning. So the easiest, uh, most simple assumption that we have is like, let's just delete uh, letters at random. 
So we do that, so we leave 50% of the letters, 75% of the letters, 90% of the letters, and then the, the, the degree distribution start look a lot more like an exponential one, so showing that maybe this is one of the things driving uh, this very skewed distribution that we see, but what's more interesting for us was the idea that the network structure itself seems to be very resilient, seems to be the same even when we delete 90% of the letters. Uh, so we started investigating what, if that is really the case. So this is, if you do a simple uh, correlation coefficient between the full network, where we have all the documents, with what we have when we delete uh, these different uh, percentages. And again, it's very stable, the network. The structure, the overlap structure, when we delete 50%, it's pretty much the same. So we started thinking, why could that be? And then we realized that it is the very the uh, initial hypothesis that we have is the ego reinforcement that is doing that. So it creates um, a lot of extra letters from the same person again and again, so it means that even when we delete this information, is not getting lost in time. So our main hypothesis is what driving this sort of resiliency. Uh, so this is just a, a proof of concept and also like then it takes us to the main point of why of the ABM, but also the why we need to be uh, careful when using a ABM to do this kind of analysis. So we have a lot of flexibility as compared to other modeling approaches, but because of that, we have to be very careful about our own assumptions. So going back to this resiliency, uh, the robustness of it, one thing we can talk about is like what drives the robustness. So let's say we add this idea of a small word network. So before we run the simulation, with 20% of probability, we rewire the connections that they have with the local neighbors to long ties. So now I have connections with, so someone from The Hague might have a connection with someone in Stockholm. Uh, and then what we see is that the, no, the network seems to be as robust when we add that. And it, this is because those long ties are not as resilient in a way. You don't have as much uh, copies of the same letters. And once they're gone, the network sort of fragments. So again, this is the idea that our hypothesis is what driving uh, the effects of the deletion on the, the networks. Uh, so another way of seeing this, and I'm going to go very fast, is that we can see these different network statistics and how this combined. Uh, so blue ones, I, I actually don't think you can see it, but blue ones is without uh, a local network. Uh, red ones is with a uh, small word network simulation. Uh, we see how much variation we get in uh, path length and centralization. Uh, uh, the other thing, so right now we are only playing with different variations of the startup of the model, but you can also think about how the deletion or the pruning affects uh, some of these statistics. So instead of deleting at random, what happens is we preserve 25% of the letters from uh, the top five people, the ones who have most letters, but we delete 90% of everyone else. And then what you see is that in the network, you start the centralization sort of shifting to the right. So start getting more centralized. Uh, and just for uh, uh, sake of reference, the dash red line is the one we observed with the Dutch network. So as you can see, starting getting closer and closer in a way to what we actually observe. So this idea that maybe uh, the data archival is what is driving the results that we see in terms of centralization. Uh, and then this is just so certain things that we're thinking about, how that's the top of the model, but it can also how that relates on the deletion of the letters. Another thing, we, this is the main point of agent-based modeling, and it's something that we haven't really stepped into and we're starting to considering, is the idea of heterogeneity. So agent-based modeling allows you to not have uh, uh, representative agents, uh, each agent can be different and we can give them like different variables and this can then play a role into how these networks are built. Uh, so we started discussing, for example, in the terms of gender and how can we add that to this network. So we can have uh, uh, the people have different activation rates or they have more homophily, they're more likely to connect with one another, they're more likely to write about certain topics that are less likely to preserve, or simply uh, they're more likely that their letters don't survive in time. And does that affect uh, the overall network? So just to conclude a little bit, uh, what we have, what I was trying to show here is a proof of concept. This idea that we can use this model in order to understand how both our hypothesis of what is driving the creation and exchange of the lattice, but also what is preserving or not this lattice affects the general structure of those social networks. Uh, but now what we need is a means to have a robust way of seeing these things and, and visualizing these effects. 
Uh, and this is a problem with agent-based models in general. There is not really a well-established, robust uh, means of conveying this kind of information, but we were then uh, um, reaching out to this uh, sort of uh, network mobile space uh, in order to try to do that for our case. So what we have at the end of every simulation, we're keeping this sort of data that we have information on uh, what is the very uh, assumptions behind the, the, the agent base. So we have, it's like, is there an activation rate? So do agents have, like, less, diff uh, have different probability of sending lettuce? Uh, do we have this small word connection? Uh, we can also see, instead of just being true or false, this could be, a, um, uh, uh, for example, the small word word is the rewiring probability. So it's like 50% of the letters uh, or not uh, is rewiring. Uh, how is it that we delete the letters? Uh, is it at random? How much are we deleting? And in the end, we have another uh, part of the table, which is the information on the networks. So in this case, what we have is the variation. So how much the network differs from the one when we have the full sample? Uh, and then with this full information, we can try to do some sort of, of um, PCA in order to understand a little bit of how these things are clustered together. So what kind of hypothesis relates with the, what kind of uh, uh, networks. And then we can also plot our own networks that we observe with the historical data to see how they're positioned in this morphous space as compared to uh, the ones we generated with this different sort of assumptions. Uh, again, so this is very fast, uh, but... Uh, if you, in case you're interested, you can always reach out uh, to some of uh, our model and try to, yeah, so you can try for yourself, uh, run some of these versions of this, this lattice sending model. Okay.